Um, I am delighted to see some very un, you know, unfamiliar names, many of them distinctly Israeli sounding, so a very warm welcome to you. Uh, I hate to start with apologies, but as you can hear, my voice is horribly croaky and I'm just praying that my voice will indeed hold yes, out. Yes, yesterday. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit better. Yes, I've had this beastly cold that will not let me alone. Uh, so my apologies for, for that. But it's I, I'm not the star attraction. It's definitely Yona. So I will just keep my introduction very brief. Anyway, for those of you who don't know about the Insiders Outsiders project, of which I'm the founding director, perhaps I could say a few brief words about that. I know Yona is one of our most loyal <laughs> online followers, which is lovely. Um, it started off life as a year-long nationwide in-person festival taking place across the length and breadth, I have to say, it, of the UK to celebrate, but also to look in a much more nuanced and critical way at the immensely rich and diverse contribution of refugees from Nazi oppression and persecution to British culture. And of course, Edith Hoffman fits into this category you know, very well, as you can immediately see. And then of course, not of course, but we all know March, 2020, exactly a year after the festival started, thankfully, COVID hit. And like so many other people, we had little alternative but to go online, but it's given the project a very rich and I think gratifying afterlife, though I say it myself, in the form of an ongoing program of online events, of which of course this one is part. So fine, let me um, carry on by, I think many of you know Yona personally, but for those of you who don't, I will just give you a brief introduction. Yona, as I'm sure most of you by now know is indeed Edith Hoffman's daughter, born in London in early 1940, uh, 19, mm -hmm. in the middle of the, or not the, quite the middle, towards the end of the Second World War. And at the age of six months, due to the bombing of London, she was evacuated to Leamington Spa in the Midlands, and Edith, her mother, apparently visited her every week. Um, and in the process met Dennis Sutton, who some of you will know was then the editor, or later, in fact, the editor of Apollo magazine, and indeed, after, some years later, many years later, Yona's employer. Uh, Yona completed her MA at the Courtauld Institute here in London, and after a year working at Apollo, spent 15 years as a curator at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, specialising in Dutch and Flemish art. After becoming a mother in her turn, she accompanied her husband to the United States, where they remained for some, well, over 30 years. And from Washington, she continued to contribute to uh, reviews, exhibition reviews, to Apollo magazine. Uh, her mother, as many of you will realise, lived to an extraordinarily venerable old age. And Yona has asked me just to say that she was able to spend much time with Edith in her last years, and we will no doubt hear much more about, about that. Uh, so just a few housekeeping rules before I hand over to Edith. I'm sure you all by now, yeah. uh, now know the ropes you know, very, very well. Please remain muted. There will, of course, be a chance afterwards to ask questions. In the first instance, if you wouldn't mind typing them in to the, uh, the chat function, ideally uh, addressing them to me, Monica Bomduch, and not to everyone so that you know doesn't get distracted by them flashing up on screen. Uh, the event is being recorded. If you don't wish to be at all visible, then turn off your cameras as well. I'll tell you more about where you can access the recording towards the end. So without further ado, it's my very, very great pleasure to hand over to Yona to talk about her mother, Edith Hoffman. Well, it's been a great pleasure working with Monica. And uh, please excuse me if I am a little bit jerky because I'm looking at a screen where I have my notes to my left. And uh, I tried to uh, work out how long this was going to take, but of course I didn't really know how to use the timer on my phone, so it went backwards instead of forwards, <laughs> so you'll bear with me. In any case, um, my mother, Edith Hoffman, two Fs, two Ns, was born in 1907 in uh, Vienna to parents who were actually from uh, uh, Bohemia in what is now Czechoslovakia. Um, and uh, she lived for 108 and a half years dying in Jerusalem in 2016. Uh, she was active and uh, all there until about two years before she died, and that was very fortunate. So um, it, there used to be a blog on uh, the website of the Burlington magazine, which I'll tell you about in a moment, um, which called her, quote, the first unofficial woman editor of the Burlington magazine, um, the Burlington Magazine is 
a serious academic uh, monthly uh, publication, which was founded in 1903 by Roger Fry. Um, and she first, her first function there was as editorial secretary. Later, she became assistant editor from 1946 to 1950 when she left. And um, she continued with her connections with the magazine uh, until about 1995, contributing book reviews and exhibition reviews from the six or seven countries where she later lived. Um, well, of course, she she had many friends who were artists, uh, many of them very good artists in England and elsewhere. Many of them also emigres, of course. Uh, and her, her interests were, of course, art, uh, literature and its connections with art. Um, she was fascinated by modern dance movements in Germany when she was young. Uh, and she always knew the names of so many plants and flowers. Uh, she could always name them. And she was a left-leaning person politically. And, of course, she left me many books, letters, photographs, and her research papers, uh, many of which she didn't actually use in the end. So I'm going to go down a page. Oh, yes, if, Monica, you could so show the next three slides. That's two, three, and eventually... A little later, four. Um, the first, of course, is the one you saw on the opening screen, which was from 1950, which shows my mother as an elegant professional person using the, the veil that was fashionable at the time and wearing a card, a, a pullover that her mother would have uh, knitted for her and uh, a necklace which went with the bracelet that you will see in the other portraits that she bought herself on the Kurfürstendamm in Berlin when she was young, and she was very proud of that. So let me go down a page. And then the, the next one that you will see was from about 1947. Uh, the previous, the ones from... Uh, uh, Paris uh, were done by uh, Franz Femfort, himself a refugee from Nazism, who had been the editor of Die Aktion, uh, a very left-wing uh, uh, art and cultural magazine in Berlin, which uh, Tamara, sorry, <laughs> my mother's father, Camille Hoffmann, had actually contributed to and subscribed to. And then the one showing me at three being fed by her in a garden. We, it was probably uh, in a house that we rented for the summer. Um, and you can see in it my mother's hairstyle. She never cut her hair ever until my father had died when she was uh, well over 90. And uh, she used to be able to sit on it. And here you see that she had it in a plait, which was wound around the back of the head. And that was how I knew her when she was, uh, when I was young. No, it doesn't do that. All right, I'll have to do it on the screen. One second. Yona, sorry to interrupt. Just tell me, pretend we're in the room together. Just tell me when you want me to move, move to the next. Yes, well, have you, have you shown the next two by Franz Femfurt? Can you not see on your own screen where I'm at? No, at the moment I'm seeing just Zoom. Post attendee Zoom. That's ridiculous. No, ah, that's no. strange because I assume everybody else. Can I just make sure that everybody else is seeing the images? I did before. I'm on. Well, listen, we'll manage. I'm on the. It's clearly a. a, a ah, now I see. Now I see the next okay, picture fine. and myself. And I see who just entered. Hello, Claudine. <laughs> anyway, uh, the next one is uh, a school performance in the uh, uh, small town near Dresden where my mother grew up until the age of about 14. Uh, this was a very interesting place. It's called Hellerau by Dresden. 
A lot of interesting people and intellectuals lived there. Uh, it was founded as a garden suburb on the British model. And Heinrich Tessenau was the architect who built the main building, uh, which was the Festspielhaus, which is still there. When I visited it, it still had murals showing uh, Soviet Russian things on the walls, but I think those have been removed and it's still in use. Um, it was used um, for um, originally um, rhythmic gymnastics, which were invented there. And um, so there's the performances of all things of uh, Shakespeare's A Middle A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, with my mother as Titania the Queen on the throne, sort of towards the left. And uh, it's interesting, this was a very progressive school. I couldn't find the name, but it doesn't matter. Um, and there were both girls and boys, and they were allowed to interrupt the teacher and ask questions. When she went to the next school in Berlin, uh, they found her a troublemaker, asking all these questions you know the thing about you ask too many questions all day long so anyway from there already quite young my mother well first she went with her father or with someone else who was an interesting personality to see the art museum in dresden which of course had a wonderful collection still does of old master paintings um and in berlin she went to a girls school called the augusta victoria schule and uh her father, Camille Hoffmann, who was uh, originally a poet and a close friend in his youth of, um, oh, the famous writer, I'll get to it in a moment. And um, at this school, she met three of the friends she would have for life. Uh, one of them was called Nina Rubinstein. Her mother was a Menshevik. There was this whole a group of uh, exiles from Soviet Russia who were in uh, Berlin and others were someone called Elna of Wurmbrandt who married the well-known phys physicist Herbert Skinner and later lived in a house near Bristol where my mother visited for weekends. And then there was someone called Sila Korn, that's her husband's name, who emigrated to Israel and that we'll hear about later. Uh, she entered the museum, the, the university in Berlin, where she studied the history of art, um, which entailed archaeology and other things that you were required to take. She was only there for one semester um, under Adolf Goldschmidt and others. Uh, of course, Berlin itself was an amazing center of high culture. It had two full-time orchestras, two opera companies, uh, avant-garde theatre and art galleries, which she visited with her father, and uh, of course the museums and more. Uh, her parents' home, which was above the uh, Czech legation uh, in Berlin, uh, they lived upstairs, they had two floors, and uh, they had a large room with a grand piano where concerts were given, and many guests, a double dining room, uh, and so on, and she met prominent modern, later called degenerate artists there. Uh, the second semester was decided she would go to Berlin, which was really the peak of uh, art history studies. And of course, there she met the famous Ernst Gombrich and his very close friend Otto Kurz, both of whom joined the Warburg Institute and moved to London at different times. And then, and to do her doctorate, uh, she went to Munich, where her doctor father was Professor Wilhelm Pinder. Uh, this was already during the rise of Nazism. Uh, apparently, Pinder was a member of the party, but he allowed his students, the Jewish ones, to finish their studies. And uh, some said that they were glad to just let them finish and get out. But either way, she did get the doctorate in early 1934, and then she went to London. Uh, during that time, there were tours for the students of various monuments and collections in the southern part of Germany. 
Um, she spent a summer at uh, a castle where there was a good collection of prints called the Feste Kurburg. Um, and she remembered always how she had walked in the evenings uh, on the streets and heard people above singing the Nazi anthem, uh, the Horst Wessel lead. So uh, then we get to a visit to England, or rather a long stay. She was there 17 years. And I've written about that in an article, which you will have the uh, link to in the Burlington Magazine of last December. Her close friend, closest friend, was an English girl who'd spent a little while in Munich called Elizabeth Senior, who was an extraordinary person in many ways. I will only say that she was the first woman curator at the uh, British Museum in the Department of Prints and Drawings. Um, as I said, she visited the Skinners. Then she was a member of the Artists' Rescue Committee, which was founded in the home of Fred Ullman, the artist, uh, in Downshire Hill in Hampstead. And uh, she, this, this was to help all the people who were connected with the artist Oskar Kokoschka, whom she'd met as a child in Hillerau, uh, escape to England. And she stayed with a, an American journalist and his uh, German wife. He was called Frederick Kuh from Chicago. And she remembered things such as going to the concert in support of the Republicans in Spain during the Civil War. Uh, Paul Robeson sang and she was very impressed. So now we can go to the next slide, please, Monica, which is number six. Edith in the exhibition of 20th century German art, which took place at the New Burlington Galleries, uh, standing facing the uh, camera. You can barely see her just behind a table with a rather hat at an angle, standing in front of an enormous triptych by Max Beckmann. And the photo is from the Tate Archive. Uh, she had trouble, of course, adjusting to all kinds of things in England, like dark tea with milk in it, and she found the food didn't agree with her digestion. Um, her mother still visited, and she visited back in Berlin. Uh, at one time, Elizabeth Senior stayed with them for a week, and her father said she was just like a member of the family. Oh, Stefan Zweig, of course, was the name I couldn't remember earlier. He was a youthful, youth time friend. Uh, well, early, they worked in the same uh, circles in Berlin, in Vienna. And uh, she, she wrote uh, all kinds of articles for different publications, including one in Prague. Uh, and uh, she, her, she had introductions through the Czech uh legation uh to uh professor constable who had recently founded the Portold institute and she got a job they had a summer school at that point where she worked as a volunteer apparently together with anthony blunt and uh Working on this exhibition, she, she came to meet the people who organized this exhibition. There's a whole book about it by Lucy uh, Wassensteiner. Um, and uh, this was as she wrote to my father when, when they had not long ago met. Uh, this is what she most loved was the expressionist art and so on. The, the, the exhibition didn't specifically say so, but it was an answer to the degenerate art exhibition in Germany. Through this, and at the same time, she met Herbert Reed, this enormously important personality in those days. And uh, he invited her to apply for the job of editorial secretary at the Burlington. In fact, when she was there, she was in the same room as Herbert Reed, um, and uh, Professor Borenius would come in, and he was really the Eminos Gris in those days, and he would come in and come with something he thought would be uh, a picture for their frontispiece, which was usually from some kind of dealers, and this was all a little bit strange. But anyway, 
uh, he had asked her whether she what she would do if there was bombing and she hoped she would stay on the job. He, in the end, was the one who had a nervous breakdown uh, later in the war. Uh, my mother was still visiting Paris. She was very uh, nostalgic for the continent. And in Paris, she met my father, who was a Palestinian Jewish person who was studying and later a journalist there. In 1938, her father, before retiring, uh, made a week's visit to London. Uh, he met Stefan Zweig, who was there, and Herbert Reed and others. Uh, but he decided that he would not be able to earn a living there because he didn't know English, which, of course, uh, with hindsight, he probably would have been employed by the um, Czech government in exile. But nobody could know that in advance, of course. And he, they continued to uh, correspond even during the war, at first through intermediaries. There was a school friend from Amsterdam who had been at her school in Berlin, who forwarded letters until they too were conquered. And then there was a, an artist called Billy Fries in the mountains in Switzerland who forwarded things. At some point, of course, this correspondence uh, ended. He he actually sent her her husband, her father some late uh, articles which are unpublished to this day about the conditions in Prague under the occupation. So uh, then we come to the war years. Uh, sometimes she was alone in the offices in uh, Mayfair, and uh, she married my father in 1940. I was born, as we said, four years later. Uh, she became assistant editor later, and of course, by this time, uh, Oskar Kokoschka, whom she had curtsied to at her father's house and had given her a big bow, uh, when she was about 10, uh, was in London and she was meeting him frequently. And th the idea of writing a book on him materialized, but only later. Uh, there were various people also who knew him, someone called uh, Greta Ring, about whom there was a recent exhibition at the uh, Liebermann House am Wannsee in Berlin. Uh, she had been uh, a dealer in Berlin, and I remember her as a, when I was a small child. She used to come and visit, and she wore all black, and she would say to me, I am the witch! <laughs> and of course, she knew and I knew that this wasn't the case. After the war, she had no idea about the concentration camps. Uh, she had the idea to ask the Rabbi Leo Beck, who had a daughter in Golders Green, if he had known her father, and he said, oh, yes, we used to spend Thursday nights together talking about philosophy and literature and so on. And he told her that he had accompanied her parents uh, to the train on the last transport to Auschwitz. They didn't know where they were going. They had big suitcases. I find that hard to believe, but... Uh, so that was it. And... She left the Burlington on very good terms with the longtime editor, Benedict Nicholson, in 1950. It was, in fact, only a year later that she accompanied my father to Tel Aviv, where he, he had already joined the new State of Israel's uh, foreign service. She continued, uh, as I said, writing for the Burlington many years. Slide seven, you already have put him up. This is Oskar Kokoschka in a later photograph of about 1965. Uh, presumably this is a watercolor he's doing of those flowers, probably in VV where he later lived with his wife. Um, Tel Aviv from 1951 was a very difficult thing for her. Uh, at that time they had what they called the Tsena, which meant that there was actually very little food for everyone. Her friend Sila from school told her, if you see people on a line outside a shop, stand in the line, in the queue, you will find that they have something to sell. 
she got to know the art world there, which of course was limited. However, there was someone called Eugen Kolb at the Tel Aviv Museum. Um, and now we can go to the next slides. Eight, nine, slowly, you know, one after the other. The first one is of Marie-Louise von Moschitsky. I think this is an unknown photograph. Um, I had brought some photographs that my mother's cousin had taken in Amersham, where she lived during the war. She was uh, an Austrian artist who had studied with Max Beckmann. Uh, she wasn't known until quite recently because she was of independent means and never needed to sell any photograph any works. But she eventually lived in a large house in Hampstead, which became the Motoshitsky Trust. And Ines Schlenker wrote the enormous catalogue resume of her works. And it was there that I met Ines, who's become a very good friend. Uh, the next one is of Lotte Horowitz, the widow of the founder, Bela Horowitz, of the Fidon Press, which moved from Vienna to London, and the rest is history, all the art books they produced and so on. She used to have house concerts to which she invited me and uh, used to invite me to their post Yom Kippur meals. I did not dare to let them know that I'd actually been to work that day. <laughs> In any case, uh, oh, I should have mentioned that Joseph Herman uh, visited Israel during my parents' visit and drew uh, immigrants facing the desert and so on. Uh, so the next painting, uh, drawing, sorry, photo is of course of uh, Gombrich with Ilse, his wonderful pianist wife, um, a great hostess and cook. And uh, of course, that was a lifelong uh, friendship. We first, we last met them in 2001 when we visited just after the bombing of the Twin Towers. And I remember him saying, he was already in a wheelchair, what a horrible world this is, and it still is. Uh, the next time we lived in Israel, the first time was in Tel Aviv, then the foreign ministry moved to Jerusalem and we lived in sort of minimal digs as it were uh, built for incoming uh, civil servants uh, we're not quite there yet um, this was the time of the Eichmann trial which I was taken to visit with my school and this was the first time my mother had told me what had actually happened about the holocaust in London, uh, that is, that, that when she had she had known about her parents' death so many years earlier, but I was never told until I was 15. And I remember asking her how she had felt about it, and she said she thought life would never be the same. But of course, you know, you have a family, you have uh, your career, you have um, friends and so on, and uh, she managed to survive it. And of course, at this point, she began... began Everywhere they went, uh, she had to entertain. There were cocktail parties, dinner parties, etc. Uh, she, she, for many years, collected material which she never used for a planned book, and she even had a Guggenheim uh, grant. Uh, but as she said ruefully when she was very old, uh, too much entertaining. Well, you can't do it all, you know. Uh, she was there. We were all in Belgium from 1953 to 56, which was lovely. My mother had very good friends among the art historians there. Um, she joined the association, the International Association of Art Critics, which was based in Paris, but the ones in Belgium were apparently much more active and became interested in the Belgian symbolist artists. We went on three plus weeks of real holidays to Switzerland and so on every year. This is something that they had always done uh, previously in her family and even longer holidays. Uh, in 1956 to 59, we were in New York. Uh, she wrote also for the Neue Zucker Zeitung and other publications and of course the Burlington about exhibitions. Uh, she got to know uh, 
the art galleries and so on. So then we went back to Israel in 1959, where uh, I went to high school, secondary school. Um, and in Jerusalem, she got to know uh, the people at the Bezalel Museum, which was a precursor of the Israel Museum. Um, she was very friendly with one of Israel's really best artists. I think on, on any level, you could say she's a wonderful artist. That is Anna Tichol, who herself was um, from, I think, Moravia. Uh, she did a lot of drawings and watercolors. She never painted in oils, but her, she bequeathed her collection to the Israel Museum. And Elisheva was Elisheva Cohen, the curator um, at the Israel Museum, was very friendly with her. There was Carl Katz, who was an American, who spent a couple of years in Jerusalem. Uh, she also wrote for the Hebrew Encyclopedia, whose editor at that time was the father of Bibi Netanyahu, Ben Zion, uh, Netanyahu. And then uh, the next place was Amsterdam uh, in the 60s. And, well, that was the 60s. Uh, there she was in friendly, to some extent, with uh, Willem Sandberg, who was the director of the uh, municipal Stedelijk Museum and with Hans Jaffe, who was supposed to be his uh, successor, but in fact did not do that, but he was a, a very good friend, a, a German refugee. Then there was uh, Horst Herzog, whom I think she'd even known in Germany, who was of course a Rembrandt scholar, and uh, Goodlaugson. They both worked at the uh, Institute for, uh, Art Historical Documentation in The Hague. Uh, then, let's see. Now we can, we can show the buffet, which is still in my flat. This was a piece of furniture her parents had acquired when they moved to Berlin. They had acquired things at auctions. And her main interest, well, a main interest in Amsterdam was uh, centered on Art Nouveau. She found Jugendstil objects. There was a lot of ceramics. There were different centers in different cities in Holland uh, where these ceramics were made. Each one had a different style. And uh, she she bought some of the best, which then was cheap. She went, you know, to, to she saw them in antique shops standing outside the window in the street. And then she went to local auctions and so on. And um, it's still a great pleasure to see. So the next place was South Africa. I don't think I have any more photos. You can just keep it up. Thank you, uh, Monica. And then uh, this was, of course, under apartheid, where my father was the representative. There wasn't an ambassador as such. And they used to move between Pretoria, which was the administrative capital, and Cape Town, where each year the uh, parliament had a session. And... Uh, and there they had African servants, and there are lots of stories about them. And then last, the last post my father had was in Paris as the cultural attaché, uh, following much in the footsteps of their mother's father. And uh, in Paris, she found that she really didn't have much connection with uh, the local art historians, except for one young uh, curator at the Louvre who worked on French paintings called Geneviève Lacombe. And of course, it was wonderful for my mother to be in Paris and she met a, a young member of the Burlington staff, I believe, and so on. Finally, they returned to Jerusalem and they acquired a flat in the neighborhood of Rahavia, uh, where a lot of former Central Europeans lived and uh, that they enjoyed very much. And they were near the Valley of the Cross. They used to sit opposite the, 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 con the, the monastery down below. We actually visited. It's still visitable down below. And you could see on the hill above it, beyond, was the new Israel Museum, uh, which uh, was built in the form of a village on a hill, uh, but very modern. 
by Israeli architects and designers. Um, later, my father died at the age of 89, and a year later she moved to uh, the uh, old age home of the organization of former uh, of descendants of former refugees from Central Europe in Jerusalem, which she where she lived for seventeen years, and uh, first in a flat of her own, then moved further down to nearer to the nurses, and eventually to the nursing department, where Regine Bion Bonfoy, a Kokoschka scholar. Uh, still visited her, and I think she was able to understand who she was, though she wasn't speaking a lot at that point. So, uh, and before that, she was still able to visit us. We, My family were in, um, for first in Minneapolis, and then in uh, Northern Virginia, near Washington, D.C., and we visited, we, we traveled together to Germany. We even went to Hellerau, where we saw someone with mushrooms, as my mother remembered picking them in the local forest, and so on. And we went back to Amsterdam, where we met the family we'd been, my mother had been so close to, the Van M. de Boas. We still managed to spend time with, with uh, Magda, her great friend who was of Czech, Czech origin, who was also an art historian and uh, more involved with uh, art historians and art critics uh, uh, meetings and so on. And uh, basically that's that's the story. I was very fortunate that she lived so long that I had the time later to spend with her and to look through her things, to encourage her to write her memoirs, which she did do in two versions. The second one dictated partly the same material to a very helpful helper. And... Uh, that was it. She was well cared for, and that's it. And now, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. How long did that take? <laughs> absolutely fine. 40 minutes. Absolutely perfect. Oh, good. Good. Lovely. Let me just... Good. Thank you so much, Yona. Uh, absolutely fascinating, as I entirely expected. It's obviously such a rich life, which intersected with the lives of so many other fascinating people in the arts. And I just wonder whether we might, with the time that we've got, but as I say, everybody, anybody who wants to ask questions or make comments, now is your chance. If you wouldn't mind typing them into the chat in the first instance, and then actually we could ask you to unmute and perhaps uh, initiate a, a conversation. But in the meantime, Yona, I wonder whether we might start, not quite from the beginning, of course, but maybe, I don't know, even if you know that much, but can you tell us a little bit more about the exact circumstances under which she actually came to England in 1934? Well, uh, she had said to her father, maybe at this point I should go back to Prague, but she'd never learned the language, even though she she did go to classes and so on. She They never actually spoke Czech at home, though her parents spoke equally German and Czech. Um, and her father unbelievably said, there is no future for Jews in Central Europe. And he, he managed to persuade both his children to go to England. His Her brother came at the very last minute. He was stuck in Paris for about six months. But eventually, one of the descendants of the Mensheviks, whom my mother got to know in England, got him a job. And that got him over at the last minute. Um, you know, he, he he actually, they had a... German, he, uh, a Swedish visa, so my mother told me, which they never used, and I never quite understood. Maybe it was because they wanted to stay near other members of the family. Uh, my mother's, my grandmother's father actually survived to raising Stutz and came back, but he didn't have good memory at that point and didn't realize that so many people had died. Uh, so she, she was able to go to England easily because she had a diplomatic passport. And uh, later she became stateless until she became an Israeli. And uh, she, as I said, she had these introductions to various people through uh, journalists and, and diplomats that her father knew. Interesting. So she never acquired British citizenship? No, she did not. I did. My children can still have British nationality, mm -hmm. but their children will not. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm trying to think there was something I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a reminder, isn't it, that actually in the early 30s, it was relatively simple, you know, from the legal and the logistical point of view to come to this country from Central Europe. The visa system hadn't yet been uh, initiated. And she obviously had the contacts that were essential and important to make her passage a relatively easy one. And the fact that she'd travel backwards and forwards is a reminder that it was still, of course, possible mm. to do that. Interesting. Yeah. You mentioned that her parents tragically met their deaths in Auschwitz. Was there, I mean, that's obviously part of the wider family story of found loss. I mean, was it the more extended family that also disappeared, as it were? I'm sorry, could you repeat I'm that? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry too. I'm just wondering, I mean, were there many other family members who simply disappeared that you never knew? Oh, yes. Uh, my grandfather was one of, I think, nine children. Um, I don't think any of them survived. Um, my grandmother, in fact, they were they were related. They were uncle and nephew and niece. But he was the youngest, and her mother was twenty years older than he was. And that's where they he stayed with them in in Vienna, and that's where they met. And it was a family scandal that they married, but everyone eventually came to terms with it. Um, she had uh, a brother who spent the years. In the, of the war in first in Paris, then in England. Uh, Leamington Spa was where he was living, which was near where his son was uh, was camped, so to speak, with the Czech army in exile, uh, who then stayed in England uh, and married a British woman. They lived in Liverpool. Uh, the uncle went back to Prague, where his non-Jewish wife still lived, and uh, they still lived in the house which had originally been built uh, by, I forget which member of the family, which is still there and there's still a relative in that house. And they, throughout the war in their basement, they had kept my grandparents' china and glass and so on. And we have it here now because after the end of communism, an Israeli diplomat arranged for those things to be shipped to my mother. And I use those glasses when we have guests for white wine. <laughs> now, I don't want to hog the conversation, as it were. I noticed, you know, there are, you've already told us, various descendants of people that your mother knew possibly quite well. And I just wonder, I don't want to force anybody to talk if they don't want to, but I wonder whether anybody would like to perhaps contribute to the event by telling us a little bit of their own memories or what they sort of gleaned of Edith as a family friend, as a, as an individual. Um, uh, a question actually, hold on, coming in. Was the Herbert Reed you mentioned the same one as the author of Green Mansions? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit ignorant. It's possible. I, he, he uh, I have a thing which is called The Knapsack, which was a, a, a um, book of poems for soldiers, which he uh, edited in the First World War. He was an art critic. His wife was a, a German origin, but still British uh, violist, I believe. That's right. Uh, but I'm not very... Oh, I meant to show this. This is the book about Kokoschka by Edith Hoffmann with two essays by Oskar Kokoschka and a foreword by Herbert Reed. Um, you know... Oh, hold it up, um, Jonas, so we can see yes, it. Yes, here we go. Who Who is it published by? It was published by Fabers. I think Herbert Reed was one of the directors of Fabers at the time. Can everyone see it? I hope so. And there's a picture of uh, a self-portrait by Kokoschka of 1937, which he called a self-portrait of a degenerate artist. That's actually become an incredibly iconic image. It's him defying the Nazi regime, proudly you know, announcing that he is indeed a so-called degenerate artist indeed. I'm um, just going back to Herbert Reed. I mean, I find him an absolutely fascinating figure who crops up in so many different contexts yes. in that 1930s. Just thing. now on the 100th anniversary of surrealism, uh, I saw a photograph which I immediately recognized of a group of people, including him, 
uh, in the surrealist exhibition the previous year at the New Burlington Galleries. He had a finger in so many pies. I yes, think, sorry, did. I don't know who PC is, but actually I have a feeling you're getting mixed up. Green Mansions <clears throat> was actually a book written by somebody called W.H. Hudson, I think. I think and so, um, yes. Herbert Reed wrote a book, uh, his only novel, I think it was called The Green Child. But he was ah. a poet, he was an anarchist, but above all, he's best known today, certainly as a... Um, an avant-garde art critic who managed to straddle the abstract surrealist, and indeed the refugee milieu, if you like, a really important figure and a tremendously loyal, I think, and consistent supporter of many refugee figures. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that he was so indeed, indeed, to, to, to your mother, absolutely. In um, the first year, in the first days of the war, they thought there would be an attack by Germany when they were at the Burlington offices. And he actually moved the offices to his house in Seal Green. <laughs> but then it turned out it was a false alarm. Mm. Yes. Interesting, interesting. A question from Ronit Seta. Could you please tell us a bit more about the process of Edith's writing the book about Kokoschka? And how much you know. Well, as I said, he, she'd known him since childhood. Um, and uh, her father had reviewed plays by him in uh, Dresden. At that time, he wrote. Later, he only painted and drew and so on. Um, and I think she was in touch with him all along. Uh, I don't remember if he came to Berlin. He probably visited. Uh, and then he, yes, of course he would have. He escaped to Czechoslovakia by, by so many people, like so many people. Of course, then the Germans took over Czechoslovakia uh, after the Anschluss in, in uh, Austria. Uh, and then uh, she visited him in Prague in 1938, I believe it was. And that time, that was when he got to know his future wife. And my mother couldn't understand that uh, connection. But of course, well, many people didn't understand my parents' connection either. And uh, uh, she got him out on the last flight out of uh, Prague to London. And he stayed at the... Ritz, I believe, and that's where she first met them, and uh, then they had weekly meetings and so on. But he he disapproved of what she'd written. There was nothing you could do about it. Oh, Ludwig Mintz was the other person. He was from uh, Vienna. Uh, I think he founded the Academie Gallery, if I'm not mistaken, and he suddenly became angry when my mother was talking about uh, 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 Greta Ring. And he, became, he he couldn't bear the idea of any dealers knowing anything or and so on. And he, he they completely stopped talking to each other. And uh, later he was in back in Vienna. They never spoke to each other again. <laughs> and do you know, you know, what it was that Kokoschka didn't like in the book that he did? Well, he about? apparently was under the impression that it was he who was writing his autobiography and that she was writing it for him. But of course, she was writing what she viewed as, you know, his art and so on. And I think she was right. Apparently the book, eventually when it came out, uh, was very well reviewed, amazingly well. And someone wrote that it was the best uh, book that had recently come out about a li living artist. Interesting. Did she know, I mean, gosh, there's so many avenues we could pursue here, but what about um, uh, J.P. Hodin? Was he a, a ah. historian that... Yeah. Well, that was a difficult relationship, too. Uh, as you probably know, there was a conference at Tate, uh, Britain, about the two of them together, and uh, many of the people attending uh, took part in it, and uh, they just didn't really get on. Uh, I'm not sure what it was all about, but... I asked partly because, of course, Hodin was also somebody close to Kokoschka, and who... Yes. But I think Kokoschka was... A difficult character and I one thing I just wanted to mention briefly is that um, in the latest biography about him by a German scholar based in London there's a rather disconcerting passage where it's quite clear that for all that Kokoschka was hailed as a kind of great cultural anti-fascist hero when it when push came to shove shall we say when he was in England consorting with the likes of Fred and Diana Ullman he made some very derogatory comments about Fred Ullman, for example, as that little Jew. I mean, you know, what is that? I won't <laughs> see that any further. So anyway, say say no more. I think there's some quite, you know, possibly unpleasant undercurrents of anti-Semitism or certainly 
prejudice and stereotyping, you know, in, in the figure of Kokoschka. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. interesting. Yes, indeed. Um, tell us what more you, what, what you can, perhaps in more detail about the really rather important exhibition, 1938 Burlington Galleries, the 20th century German art. Did your mother talk, was it one of the highlights of her time in London, would you do you say? Uh, I think so, yes. I'm uh, trying to remember whom she first met who was involved with it. Of course, there was a, a lady whose father was in the British Foreign Service who had a gallery in London. Maybe it was the London Gallery, but there was there were two on the same in the same street. Um and uh eventually, well, she she wrote about it that uh none of these people really knew anything about. Uh, 20th century German art, uh, and that was the case. You know, she actually had brought across to England some works uh, that belonged to someone called Edwin Redslob, who was the what, what they called the uh, Reichskunstwart in the, under Weimar. Uh, he, he was in charge of the art uh, things for the government. And he wanted to sell these things because he had been uh, banned by the Nazis and he wanted to pay his daughter's university education. So he hoped that she could sell some things for him in London. And she found it very difficult. Uh, the V&A eventually acquired a few of these things, um, which I'm sure they still have uh, in the prints and drawings department. And there was a Kirchner, for example, uh, which she lost sight of. She had it hanging in her flat when she eventually moved to a flat of her own, which she uh, shared with someone uh, who was a physicist, a German Jewish person. Uh, and uh, she couldn't remember anymore which of the various Kirchner street scenes it was. And what happened was, was the exhibition went to America and toured there and... Uh, uh, this man, Messens, a Belgian surrealist, uh, was in charge of this tour. And eventually the things were in some storage in London when they came back. And she was never able to find it again. And she felt so bad about it for many years. But he was, um, the owner was very good about it all and, and said he didn't mind. And she'd been helped. He, she had helped him and so on. And uh, that was it. What you're saying, I think, is a really important reminder of one very basic fact that in the 1930s, most people, even of a cultured you know, background in this country, either well, they either knew very little about modern German art, as you rightly said, or were actually quite deeply antagonistic to it because they were mm. the French tradition of a much more decorative sort of approach to what an artwork might be. There was also the post-World War I political context context that made it perhaps not that surprising that German art was regarded with suspicion. But I think, you know, this is a really important thing to keep in mind. I've absolutely. An early collection, of course, is the one in Leicester. I, I was going to ask you about that. Do you happen to know, if, again, whether your mother had direct con connections with the Hess family? That's you know. Well, she knew them, definitely. Um, but I don't think she ever went to Leicester. Mm. I actually visited and there are some nice things there. But I can quite understand, you know, these uh, expressionist works were so against what British people were used to. There's an extraordinary quotation by Raymond Mortimer that was actually, I think, written in the New Statesman in response to that 1938 exhibition, saying something, and I paraphrase slightly, that if Hitler didn't like these paintings, it's the best thing I've heard about Hitler, which actually gives me goosebumps you know, bumps every time <laughs> I even sort of say it out loud. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Yes. Indeed. Indeed. And um, perhaps I can just use that opportunity to mention that somebody called Andrea Lehmann is going to be giving a talk about a really interesting and under-researched exhibition that took place at um, uh, uh, Leicester Art Gallery in 1944, the year you were born, called Mid-European Art. And what it actually was, was an extraordinary bringing together, mostly based on the Hess family's collection that they've managed to bring over from Germany to Leicester, of all places, in the Midlands, um, of avant-garde German art. And uh, Andrew has been doing some research into the context and the kind of genesis of that project. It's going to be in early April. So do keep an eye on the Insiders Outsiders website. I'll send everybody opposite links uh, later on so you know where to where to look. So there's still much, I think, to be found out about this, you know, very interesting 
cultural sort of tension, if you like, between the Germanic tradition and, and the British one, if one can generalize indeed. Now I'm looking at the time, any other questions or um, don't worry about the links. As I say, what I'm going to do after we've finished here, I'll send a group email out to everybody who signed up for the talk with all the relevant links for you to pursue in your own your own time. Because there's also a useful article, isn't there, by Lucy um, Watling, now Wassensteiner, and also the link to the Burlington article that you yourself wrote just recently, which people will find, find useful. Um, what about the artist refugee committee that you mentioned, the Fred Ullman connection? Was Edith actually living? She, she was living in Hampstead at the time. I would suppose. My mother, but was she living in Hampstead? In no, the... no, she never lived in Hampstead. Oh, she she lived so... in a series of rooms in boarding houses and this kind of thing until uh, I think it was about 1938 when she decided that she really needed a place of her own, and her mother. Uh, came to help with the move, and that was when they moved furniture and, and the things by uh, that belonged to Redslob. Um, and uh, she moved around a lot, of course. Uh, you know, that was the way it was in those days. And she lived in a crescent. My father also had a room in the same place uh, overlooking uh, Regent pa Regent's Park. And that was I a great pleasure. I ask about Hampstead because it actually was an extraordinarily rich site of what you might call cultural interchange even in that in that period. There's actually, mm. I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but there's an essay that I myself wrote on that subject in the Insiders Outsiders Anthology. Again, I'll add that to the list of things you oh. might like to pursue, but it's it's where they all literally, physically, most of them were, including, of course, Herbert Reed. Um, so, yes, an interesting uh, location. For there's sure. one more artist I should mention. That was Katerina or Kate Wilczynski. Ah, yes. And she was, a, she was a fascinating character. I remember going to, she had parties in her studio in, uh, um, off where, at Kensington Church Street. And you could see, you could hear the, the, it was just a one big room where she both worked and lived and entertained and Arthur Kaufmann, the dealer, would come. Um, and uh, you could hear the trains rumbling underneath, you know, <laughs> the circle line. She's <laughs> a really interesting, she was a wonderful draftswoman, wasn't she? I think she's Very, a, yes, a yes, talent definitely. still to be re rediscovered, absolutely. And you mentioned Kaufman, I was actually going to say that Michael Kaufman, who of course later became director of the Courtauld, presumably yes. his father, I think he was a great admirer of Wyszynski's work. So there are all these... Yes, he was a serious artist, a dealer in, in uh, uh, you know, old masters and so on. There's so much more one could say about this kind of network of dealers, collectors, indeed art historians, all again intersecting. Um, Michael Goldhaber, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question directly? Hello, hello. Can't see you at the moment. Uh, where are you? He's in uh, Berkeley. Okay, yes, yes do, 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 do go ahead. Yeah. Sure. It's very, I'm a late riser, so it's very early for me. <laughs> okay, well, thank, <laughs> thanks for making me i not using the photo, but. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned a physicist who, mm. who lived with her. That in was London. your mother. That was my mother, yes. Ah, uh, right. Ah, I'm who, going to pursue please, that. Please give yeah. us the name. I'm so bad with names these days. Yes, and oh. uh, her name was Gertrude Scharf at, at the time. Gertrude um, Scharf. Uh, later published uh, a lot of physics under Gertrude Scharf Goldhaber when she came to the U.S. And... Uh, I've written a, a memoir of her uh, that is available. I'm sure you can locate it online. Um, but also I wanted to mention that when your mother was in New York, uh, this had little directly to do with England, I suppose, but I was a teenager and she took me to the Picasso exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, I saw it too. And it was an incredible introduction for me to modern art, which I have built on and certainly never forgotten. And it was a very important part of my life. So thank you for that. Thank you, Michael. I might well be in touch with you about your mother because there are various quite ambitious plans afoot. Um, under the aegis of the Insiders Outsiders project. One of them is actually to look more broadly at the reception experience of academics immigrate academics to this country specifically, but I don't know, did she spend time 
in this country at all, or was it just in the U.S.? No, she she lived in London uh, with uh, Edith Hoffman, but oh, of course she did. Yes, she was in so London so. from nineteen thirty five to thirty nine. Interesting. Uh, um, if I may, I'll be in touch. At some that point. was the flat where. Uh, not far from Paddington Station. Uh, I think there were three rooms, and each of them had their own room, and then there was a sitting room. And uh, later on, my father moved in, and uh, they lived there into the bombing. And then when the building next door collapsed, uh, even though it hadn't been hit, they decided they'd better move to a better place, and they moved to a uh, very lovely tall building in St. Petersburg Place, um, which my mother's great friend Helga Green Connolly, uh, who was a, uh, a literary agent and had been married to the director, later the director of the BBC, um, Hugh Carlton Green, she had lived in that uh, building. I don't know whether he did too or not, but uh, anyway, that was the connection. Fascinating. I think we probably better uh, tie up. Uh... A nice message from, from Audrey Gottlieb, thanking you for such a fascinating presentation. I'm going to end with a very obvious question, Yuna. You say that your mother left, there were research papers unpublished, that she wrote memoirs, which I think I'm right in thinking have not been published. Well, my aim is to do that, yeah. to combine it all and add things from the letters and so on. I'm really delighted to hear that. I mean, clearly she deserves a proper rounded biography, doesn't she, which would incorporate her own writing. So keep keep us posted. Keep me posted. Now, so indeed, I'm indeed. Happy, happy to spread the word. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. I'll just end also on a practical note by saying that just by happy coincidence, an exhibition of Marie Luz von Motoshitsky's wonderful paintings of women is about to open literally this week on Wednesday at Berg House and Hampstead Museum here in London. For those of you who are in London, I can send you the link about that. Fabulous artist, really, really superb. And I'm wonderful. definitely going to visit that. Good. And just to uh, reiterate, this event has been recorded. It will be uploaded on the Inside is Outside is YouTube channel within the next week or so, so you can access it there, tell other people about it. And though I say it myself, that YouTube channel has become a very rich source, a resource of recordings of past um, uh discussions, talks like this one on a very wide range of you know, totally fascinating subjects. So I would highly recommend that you take a, you know, take a look and, and uh, a browse through it. The Insiders Outsiders Festival.org website is where you go to to sign up to the newsletter if you'd like to be kept informed of our future activities. There's lots of interesting things in the pipeline. And uh, on that note, I think I will just say once again, thank you very much, Yona, um, Oliver saying thank you as well. Thank you everybody from far and wide, uh, different countries for attending, different time zones, etc. And uh, a very good night to you. And I hope to see you again at future uh, events. And Yana, once again, many, many thanks. Many thanks. Thank you for Thank attending, you. everyone. Good, good night. Good night, everyone. Be well.